So we're going to go on a little journey from music to tech and impact. So basically, I want to start with a question. What is the craziest thing that you can do with your tongue? We're all thinking about the same thing, right? Controlling a wheelchair. So, <laughs> what we did was basically to create this device, smart braces, that fit in the mouth and enable you to control the digital devices around you, like a phone, a computer, smart home, and even a wheelchair, like this uh, medical sunrise wheelchair right next to me. So, how did we even get to the point of trying to control wheelchairs with our tongue, successfully or not? It all starts for me with music. I was performing uh, live ever since I was 14 years old, and after over a decade of playing shows and being in the studio, I started getting really frustrated with this notion of, you know, dudes in t-shirts playing guitars, and I felt like there has to be more, both in, like, as an audience member and as a performer. I wanted to expand the spectrum of what it means to play music. Also, I feel like on some level, you know, spending so long pursuing your childhood dreams without really trying to affect anybody else's lives in a really specific or meaningful way starts to become kind of a burden. There's this emptiness to like doing something only for yourself for so long. And these thoughts for me uh, basically led me to experiment with technology and specifically, I was very drawn to sensors and the idea of using the body to make music. And this kind of became my, my main question at the time. How can we translate the human body into music in new and interesting and innovative ways? And this led me to do these conceptual tech-infused shows, like this one that was actually for Google um, during their anniversary event in Israel, where everything on stage was translating physical signals into music. So this woman, for example, was running, and her heartbeat was creating the rhythm. This guy was meditating, and his brain waves were generating the melodies. And my movements were tracked by a camera, so the motion would orchestrate the entire show. And none of this was using any traditional instruments. It was all the biological symphony of the human body. And when we're thinking about the biological symphony of the human body, I like to arbitrarily think about it as two different kinds of signals. The first one would be the physical, voluntary signals of the body. Things like your movements and your voice. These are the things you can actually control. These are the things that you can use to express yourselves like you would with any musical instrument. But then on the other hand, you have other kinds of signals, which are more like biological, involuntary signals. Um, your heartbeat, your brain activity. So just like in the video before, you could influence these kinds of signals. By running, you could accelerate your heartbeat. By meditating, you might be able to calm down your brain activity. But you can't really control them. You can't decide what you want to play and just play it. And therefore, the first one has more to do with you playing the music, while the second one has more to do with the music playing you, like musical biofeedback. First time I ever saw this graph by the Israeli startup Neurosteer, I was really inspired. This is basically a guy who has been meditating for many, many years, connected to EEG, which is a technology that measures and tracks the electrical activity in the brain. And using this kind of um, technology, Nurstir was able to show how at a certain point, when he went deep into trance, his brain signal completely changed. Because you could see it's basically alpha brain waves showing you how focused or how tired or how engaged someone is. And at a certain point, when he became deep in trance, it completely changed that graph. And when I saw this, I thought about this as musical notation almost. It looked to me as if 
this was playing music back at me. And I started to think about how can we use this to make music. And so I collaborated with this company and with a really inspiring individual named Sefi Udi, who is a paraplegic. He's paralyzed from the neck down. But before his accident, he used to play the guitar. And he wanted to play again and didn't know how. And so what we did was we created a musical interface using the EEG device. And we enabled him to start controlling the music. And this is kind of an important uh, differentiator between the idea of I hear a melody in my head and my thoughts are being played back, like and the music just plays. That doesn't really work. What does work is by influencing your alpha brain waves, by calming yourself down or getting yourself worked up, you could trigger different things in the music. And Sefi was actually probably the most proficient in this that I've ever seen. After doing this with him, I actually used this technology myself on stage and I gave it to other people, but nobody has been able to replicate his level of control over the music, which I think has a lot to do with the sharpness of his mind and the condition of his body. And this person would actually come back and spiral back uh, in the stock. So try and remember him. I then started uh, playing around with this idea of wearable devices. The first thing I've ever created in this realm was actually using the Google Glass, the first edition back in the day. And we used the um, head tracking feature of Google Glass to enable you to play music using your head movements, which led to some really bizarre shows. And I then started thinking about, can we take the two signals and combine them into one, creating this musical hat? So the hat had this idea of head tracking, where you can use those motions to consciously control the music. And you could use these buttons to influence the music at will. But in the inside of the hat, there was also the EEG device, which measured the electrical activity in the brain. And so the show was this weird combination between you controlling the music and the music playing back your biofeedback. It then started becoming more and more grandiose and ambitious in terms of shows. This show for uh, Microsoft was just throwing everything into it. We had actual instruments, like uh, the Aboriginal ancient instrument of the didgeridoo, a drum kit, a guitar, but we also had the EEG device and the heartbeat sensor all playing together. The different signals were being sent from the instruments into these plates of sand and water that would create these geometric shapes and form according to the music. And this is a really interesting phenomenon called cymatics. So this idea of cymatics is really just the forms and shapes that different frequencies and vibrations get when they run through physical matter. You normally have this kind of plate set up with water or sand in it. And as you send a vibration or frequency into the plate, it changes the form. And it forms a very specific shape every time. And if you do this right, it will form the same shape every time, which is fascinating. So for example, in this video of a demonstration we did of this, we were sending 430 hertz, which is basically the note A. So the note A had this shape. Interestingly enough, this wasn't really a complete shape in my mind. I felt like it was somewhat incomplete. And so we tried other shapes. We sent 563 hertz into the same plate of sand. And it became this shape. And then we realized we might try and send the golden ratio, 963, which is of great significance in math and in nature, and see what this becomes. And surely enough, this was a really interesting result. The whole plate vibrated, or is it just like at a point? The whole, the whole plate is, it has like a speaker beneath it. It receives the entire vibration. It then started occurring to me that I have to like literally fly to all these places and be on stage and do this myself, where it could also be just objects or sculptures or interactive art installations doing the same for many more people. So we created different types of installations. This one, for example, is a sculpture of a heart. And when you touch your hand at the center of the heart, when you put your palm at the center of it, it plays back your pulse.
This next installation is called Rorim, which is the word mirror spelled backwards. And it mirrors your movements with lights and with sounds. But it gets really interesting when two people use it at the same time, because then it starts reflecting or mirroring how in tune and how harmonious they are with one another. Only when you move it the exact same way in the exact same time does the piece really come to life. And a third example of these interactive installations is a thing I created with my friends Nir and Hampus called portals, which are different trees that are interconnected and are communicating with one another when you touch them. So when you touch the first tree, you start charging it up. When it's fully charged, it activates the second tree. Then someone on the other side could answer your call. interaction. Uh, this one was in Sweden and had two trees right next to each other, but we also created one where the first tree was in Tel Aviv in Israel and the second tree was in Stockholm in Sweden, and people could communicate not only with the trees but also with these screens and cameras connecting the two countries, which was basically a very elaborate way to get Israeli men to hit on Swedish women. They were just like touching the tree, you know, going like, is it Kolder? What's your name? Um, so doing these kinds of things, you know, was kind of starting to answer the first question I asked in the beginning, which was how to, I guess, make it more interesting or more innovative uh, as far as art goes. But the second question I was asking myself about the impact or meaning of this work was still unanswered. I felt like these things were cool and they were interesting, but they weren't really creating real impact in the world. And so the next question became, how can we create real impact using this kind of work? And I started understanding the beginning of my answer when working with Racheli, who was at the time nine years old and living in Jerusalem. And she was both physically and cognitively impaired to the point where she couldn't really do anything. She couldn't speak and she couldn't really move other than moving her right hand in a very kind of general way. But she had this amazing smile and kind of infectious energy. And we really wanted to do something for her. My friend Erez, who knew her, asked me, how can we enable this person to play music? And this was quite a riddle. I framed it as a one button machine because you only have one button, in this case, this one movement of the hand. And you have to use this one button to create music. And so what we did was we created this glove and gave it three different modes. And the first mode was drum mode. So every time Rachel would do this motion, one time would go The second time would go And so when she go She could start playing music and she could listen and kind of feel that sense of rhythm in her arm. The second mode was DJ mode, where we took her favorite song, which is a super happy song about the Messiah, and we broke it into pieces. And basically every time she would trigger the next part with her hand, she had to really listen, because it could be too early or too late in the song, basically really making her musical hearing develop. And then the third mode wasn't even musical. We invited Racheli's mother to my studio, and we recorded her reading Rachel's uh, favorite children's book. And then I cut that book into different sentences and again gave her that active experience of controlling her own um, storytelling experience. So instead of her just being a passive listener, she could actually trigger the next sentence whenever she wanted to. Doing this kind of work with Rachel and with Sefi, the uh, person I mentioned earlier, kind of framed the next question that was forming in my mind, which was how can we make music accessible? Maybe that is the path to the kind of impact I was trying to, to find. And so this theory, theory called uh, the Music Accessibility Pyramid was forming in my mind. At the top of this pyramid, there are professional musicians. These are the people who spend their time, energy, and money on music and then make money back and are basically in this position to do whatever they want to if it goes well. Then you have the hobbyists who might spend all their energy, time, and money on music, and they're not looking to receive anything but their own um, satisfaction, their own interest. 
but they also could do whatever they wanted to express themselves. Then you have non-musicians who often think, oh, I should have started playing when I was much younger. Now it's too late. And that's obviously wrong. Most of us can right now pick up an instrument, secondhand, borrow from a friend. We can go online on YouTube, or we can just get a teacher, and we can learn to play in no time. But there is a whole other layer of, of uh, people with special needs that might have all the time and energy and ambition and even talent to make amazing music, but they're hindered by their physical or cognitive condition. And I know that last layer, by the way, is not the biggest layer, but bear with me. When we connect the two points, the two parts of the pyramid, these two ends combined could create some kind of transformation. And trying to make that happen, I co-created an event called Discotech, which stands for Disability Community Technology. And the idea behind it was creating the first framework that was dedicated only to create music technology for people with special needs. Creating the first framework for music technology for people with special needs. And so what we did was we had four different individuals with four different challenges. And around each of them, we had a team of makers, developers, musicians, and therapists that were developing a solution for that one person. Offer, so, uh, Offer suffers from a neurological disorder. And he used to play and compose and produce music, but now he couldn't do that anymore. So his team created uh, an eye tracking system that enabled him to compose music using his eyes. Moi was born autistic and blind, and he could play really well with one hand, but the other hand he could only play with one finger. So his team created a pedal board that enabled him to make up for the chords he couldn't play with his left finger using his feet. Liron was a professional musician, and he was injured in a snowboarding accident and ended up in a wheelchair. So his team turned the wheelchair into a setup, enabling him to plug in all of his instruments and loop himself, basically turning it into a one-man band. And last but not least, Kineret is a professional singer that was born with one hand, and so she could never really accompany her own vocals until her team designed and 3D printed a prosthetic arm that enabled her to play the guitar for the first time in her life. So, there are two main insights or lessons learned from this uh, experience. The first one had to do with the pyramid. So I realized while working on this, that what we were actually doing in a way was flipping the pyramid on its head. Because in a way, when you're focusing on the person that has the biggest challenge, you're actually kind of trickling down and helping everybody else that is part of your pyramid. In this um, example, we can take the eye tracking system. So a person who cannot play music or cannot compose music without the eye tracking system obviously needs it most. But once you have this device that solves his condition, you actually can help the professional musician explore new ways to create uh, the hobbyist to have a new toy to play with and the non-musician to have a new and intuitive way to try and experiment, to try and learn music and play music. The second thing that I've learned from doing this was that none of the things we created was actually scalable. All of these solutions were meant for a specific individual with a specific condition and it required some kind of specific setup. So in a way, it wasn't really going to affect the lives of millions of people like we had hoped for. So this got me thinking about how can we really make that difference? And I realized we're actually talking about two different challenges that would require two different solutions. The first challenge is about music. How can we make music accessible to as many people as possible, regardless of their condition, regardless if they're healthy or disabled, if they're young or old, if they're a professional musician or just getting started? How can we make music as accessible and intuitive as it could be? 
And the answer to that question for me was the instrument, which is the device on my hand. The idea behind this wearable device is that it takes that notion of voluntary signals, of the thing you can really control, which is hand movements, and turns it into a super intuitive instrument. So playing drums, for example, would look like this. Or you could just grab a frequency Or you can try and make a whole song. I'm going to loop myself and add layers to this. Now we could use a little bit of like chorus vocal type thing. The second question, if the first question was really about how to focus on music regardless of disabilities, the second question became how to focus on disabilities regardless of music. How can we really make the world accessible for those who need it, for those who need this kind of accessibility, regardless or beyond just playing music? And the answer to that question became this device called Tongo. And the way this started was with uh, a biomedical engineer called Tal, who came to meet me because she wanted to create a musical instrument for people with ALS. And the idea was to enable them to play music using their tongue. And I thought it was an amazing idea, but being disillusioned with creating music technology for people with special needs and nothing more, I immediately told her, let's use the tongue to enable them to do a lot of different things, way beyond music. And this is what we've been doing ever since. We've been working on this for about a year and a half. Now I wanna tell you a few things about the tongue so you get the idea. First, I'd love you to just like take the tongue right now and touch from the inside of your teeth, just touch one tooth. Now touch another one. Now slide between them. We all have this really incredible orientation within our mouths using our tongue. It's almost like we already have a keyboard in our mouths that we're not using. Secondly, the tongue is a very strong muscle. It can keep going for hours without getting exhausted, unlike eye tracking technology or other things that end up becoming very exhausting over time, the tongue can just keep going. And thirdly, it survives really severe conditions like neurological disorders and spinal cord injuries. And so we created these smart braces. This is the prototype of these smart braces that uh, are already patent pending and they're wirelessly communicating with different devices like smartphones, computers, um, wheelchairs, smart homes. And they're very intuitive and accessible already, making it kind of easy to use and learn for almost anybody. We created different apps for this, and I'm going to show you one of them very soon. Um, the thing about this project is that even though we were doing this in stealth, we had the privilege to get funded by the Israeli Innovation Authority and to have partnerships with IBM and the Adassa Medical Center. We even won awards from the Price for Life ALS Foundation and the Medtech Accelerator in Israel. All of this before coming out of stealth, which is what we're doing right now. We're just right now coming out of stealth. So it's very exciting for us. Dali's right here. Raise your arm. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so more than any of these partners or more than any of these things, the thing that touched us and helped us the most was collaborating with individuals who actually need this. One of them you might recognize from earlier in this talk. My name is Ahad. I'm 43 years old. I'm working as QA team leader in the high tech. My name is Afiude. I'm so old, 40 years old, and I'm an industrial designer. I do have only one hand that I can control. All of the rest, not functional. When I go with my child over the street, I'm going with afraid that they will run to, to the road. But if I could move my wheelchair using my tongue, I can hold them and make them safe. The tongue is the only muscle in the body that's uh, connected only in one side. If you train it, you can master it. I can use it with my computer mouse for Photoshop, it's solid works. You need very high resolution to draw every specific uh, aspect from the program. I used to uh, try eye tracking, but not yet soon, because I had a lot of uh, shaking in my head also. The time have the, the higher resolution above every other ability which I tried. It's a very good solution for gaming, uh, video camera, stills camera, uh, smart home. If it's connected to a Wi-Fi, to Bluetooth, to anything, any, any device, the skies are not a limit. I never thought I could move the wheelchair without my hand. It's amazing. Amazing. The thing is, as we were working on this, and we were working with people that actually needed, we realized the potential of this technology to disrupt other industries like security, gaming, sports. Just think about scuba diving, for example. Where you're already putting something in your mouth. Why not make it a smart device? And this notion is now leading us to first focus on assistive technology and rehabilitation while we're exploring this new space of mouth-based controllers and what it could do. And out of all of the apps that we've created so far, I'd love to show you the musical one. So this is Tongo. This is the operating system we've built. It has different apps, and they're all controlled by the tongue. Hi, how are you? I am hungry. I'm tired. My name is Yenigo. My name is Yenigo Montoya. You killed my father. Recognize this one? I'm going to try and play a song with it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'd like to finish this talk uh, with kind of the main message for me, which is not really about music, technology, disabilities. It's about something else. I feel like the world right now is at this point where we actually have a lot of responsibility. Our generation, the generation after us, we're inheriting a world with a lot of challenges and a lot of potential. And we have to start figuring out what we can each do to help. And in that sense, what I found in my own journey is that there is a sweet spot between what you love doing, what you would do if no one would pay you or ask you to do, and between what you feel like the world needs, the community around you, people you know, or the world at large. And where, the, where these two things meet, where what you love doing and what the world needs become one thing, is that sweet spot where doors open and things start happening. And I encourage all of us to search for that. And once we find it, to go with all of what we have to offer and direct our energy and our intention to that place. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.